Sports.com. All right, welcome into today's Purple Daily presented by TCL TVs. Enjoy more of what you love at TCL, presenting sponsor of Purple Daily, and we thank them, Judd Zolgad over there, Phil Mackey here, Declan, our wonderful executive, executive, executive producer Mm -hmm. of the show here. And um, let's just dive into it. Jeff Gladney was arrested yesterday. I'm going to read you guys a series of tweets here. We're going to talk about what this means for the Vikings. Mm -hmm. Judd has also done a little more of a sort of big picture research on Vikings recent draft history. But you guys saw the same tweets that I saw from J.D. Miles of CBS TV in Dallas. And um, if it's cool with you guys, I'm just going to read a few tweets here. We can go ahead. We can react. Let's hear it. All right, so breaking, I've learned, this is from yesterday afternoon, breaking, I've learned from sources that Minnesota Vikings cornerback Jeff Gladney has turned himself into the Dallas County Jail after the NFL player posted a $10,000 bond on a charge, third-degree felony family violence assault, which I believe is just domestic violence, right? Um, The NFL cornerback now faces up to two to ten years in prison if convicted after an incident that happened on April 2nd. That's when a 22-year-old woman who says she was in a relationship with Gladney told police they got into an altercation over text messages she was receiving. Gladney is accused of hitting the accuser with closed fists, choking her, and dragging her by the hair while driving her outside his vehicle. Some of this is a little bit like you're trying to piece together the visual of what's happening. It sounds just disturbing. She also accuses him of, quote, pulling her by her hair, trying to hold her still in order to get the face ID to work, presumably on her phone. The accuser was able to break free and get into the vehicle with unknown passengers. Detectives documented bruising on her head, ears and torso. She also reported she has scratches on her eye. She also reported scratches on her face and neck and abrasions on her knees. Uh, The Vikings responded with this statement. We are aware of Jeff's arrest and are gathering more information. We take this matter very seriously as the reported allegations are extremely disturbing. At this time, we will have no further comment. Um, Your thoughts. Where do we start? Um, It's incredibly disturbing. Uh, It it has to obviously play out in court first. Uh, but my thoughts are that the last thing that should be on Jeff Gladney's mind is playing football. And keep in mind, no matter what the courts do, the National Football League can suspend a player for just being accused of this, and they'll do their own investigation. Uh, I guess my immediate thought combining Jeff Gladney and football and the Vikings is this. Um, I think I'm going to be surprised if he plays in 2021. I think that I think that this is I, I hate to say it, but I, the reality of a report like this is there was a time probably in the 90s, right, or early 2000s where that's where, you know, it would play out through the courts and the guy might come back to you and he might play and he might be in trouble. He might not. I don't know. Um, but we didn't, unfortunately, because th- this is not a pass for us. We didn't at the time probably take this as seriously as we do now, which is too bad that we didn't. Fortunately, that's changed. So if I'm going to combine the entire thing together, Phil, I guess my takeaway is I'm going to be a little bit surprised if Jeff Gladney is playing football in 2021. Yeah, I think my first reaction is, and I, I mean, everything should be sort of at least layered with if there's more information to come out, then that information deserves to come out. And if if Jeff Gladney has an account of the incident that that needs to come out, then it should come out. And I listen. I'm all about information coming out. But this is a heinous, horrible, disturbing report. Um, it has all happened sort of quickly in terms of the report, the arrest, and now the fallout. If the Vikings were to cut Jeff Gladney today, I would have no problem with it. If they were to say, "Listen," um, yeah, we've we've heard enough, and we can validate that this is true to whatever extent. And so, the, obviously, the Vikings' bar for punishing and the NFL's bar for punishing players is lower than the bar for actually convicting, charging, convicting, and then putting a guy in jail. Uh, and maybe there's a jury trial at some point. But if they cut him tomorrow, I'd be I would not argue. 
I'm sure he would get a second chance with some team, like we've seen with some other guys, Kareem Hunt, like guys get second chances. Um, so, yeah, I mean, like there's no excuse for this type of behavior. In fact, you are a, you are a criminal if this is all laid out in truth, and you should be punished to whatever extent you deserve to be punished. So there's really there's really nothing to. This is pretty cut and dry unless there's like an alternate version of a story that pits one person against the other here, you know? Right. So I think the Vikings, just based on their track record, they have acted before. I mean, the Adrian Peterson situation was far different because that was, that was, um, I mean, this is, this is closed fists. I don't want to like compare assaults, but like this is closed fists and this is dragging someone outside of a vehicle and this is like, I think this is different than Adrian Peterson's perception of how you should raise a child, but I still disagree with taking a switch to a kid. A lot of people in the South, including Jerome Felton, who was a guest on this show, is like, I mean, honestly, that's how I grew up. Yeah. Um, the NFL put him on the restricted list for 15 games, and he missed the season. Then correct me, did Adrian come back and play for the Vikings yep. the next year? Yep. Okay. Yep. He came so, back. And and keep in mind, too, the Vikings, the Vikings' initial re- reaction to – what was transpiring with Peterson in Texas at that time was to say that, that this was between him and his family and his kid and that they, they were going to allow things to play out. And people turned and said, what are you talking about? And then the league stepped in. Uh, but again, you know what, Phil? In in the context of what we're talking about, unfortunately, that's a long time ago as far as I think thought processes go, right? Like mm-hmm. things have changed since then. And now – and I, I think what changed things – and th- this is not across the board true, but I think it changed things. When we started to see occasionally video of these things, because if you read, like, like to your point, in going through the account that you read, it sounds terrible, all right? But, like, you're right. You're you're trying to visualize it, and you're not really sure. Like, like there's some things about it that seem mur- murky. But if you go back to um, Hunt or Ray Rice— when we saw that, it was so shocking that I think it even changes our perception of incidents that we read about but still don't see film of. Mm-hmm. And I and I really think the Ray Rice thing changed things as far as saying it's one thing. It's one thing to get a description and be like, okay, I think I can piece this together. But then w- when you see the brutality, it changes m- my opinion of everything as far as it, it's probably as bad as it's reported. And it probably is worse and more shocking unless flat out there's a person lying here. And I highly doubt that. Yeah. He- here's the other thing that happens in the NFL and other sports. But this is this. The- these stories seem to be more prominent in the NFL than in the NBA. And we've seen a couple in Major League Baseball. Aroldis Chapman, um, who mm-hmm. was the closer for the Astros. Uh, Ozuna. I mean, this 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 stuff does happen in other sports. But the NFL's cases have been more high profile because of just how big the league is, the talent-to-baggage ratio factors in when it comes to the punishment and the ultimate decisions that teams make, right? Ray Rice was toward the end of his, like, he had been in the league for a while. He was still good, but, like, Ray Rice was, like, later 20s, and it was a lot easier for the Ravens to say, okay, there's video, and he's older, and so we can just find a, we'll we'll just make an example, right? Well, the Chiefs, when when Kareem Hunt, that was only like two years, I think it was 2018, Kareem Hunt um, has the assault situation, and he was one of the best, most dynamic players in the NFL at age 23. And the Chiefs were like, oh, I mean, we got to cut him. I mean, we, we, we would, how bad would we look if we didn't hold him accountable and cut him? And then the problem with the system is, well, he's still a really good player, and someone's going to take a chance on him. And the, and the Browns are like, well, I mean, well, we like giving guys second chances. Right. And so the, the Chiefs kind of got... I feel like the NFL has not found a great way to handle these situations. I mean, in that situation, the NFL basically said, okay, uh, well, I mean, Chiefs, it's kind of up to you if you want to cut him or not. It's it's a philosophical decision. And the Browns are like, well, I mean, well, listen, we'll give a guy a soft landing. And so with Jeff Gladney, I think the Vikings are probably going to cut him because I don't – I think they, they would like to see his career play out. He's a first-round pick. But, like, they also – they also don't need him to start this year now that they've got Patrick Peterson and Cam Dantzler and Mackenzie Alexander. So it actually becomes easier for them to make an example out of Gladney because, oh, we already have three cornerbacks that 
might even just be better than him going into the season, right? But someone else is probably going to give him a second chance because he's young and he's a first-round pick and he's talented. And that's how this works in the NFL. You know, you only get punished to the extent that uh, you can't help a team on the field anymore. And so maybe he doesn't play for the Vikings, but somebody else will for sure sign him once this plays out, unless he's in jail. And that's, that is 100% how this works in the NFL. So my guess is this. My, my guess is that the Vikings are going to hope that the league steps in here and he's going to end up on, on some type of, of list where he can't play, blah, blah, blah. Um, I think the pressure – so th- this is what is is the factor in, in cases with players who are first-round picks. I think the factor of cutting him comes down more to public pressure – so like if you I think the I think the team's 100%. first move is restricted list, he's not playing, but privately they're saying we're not going to cut the, this guy. Now if he was a 6-round pick, he'd be long gone. Yeah, let's see um, how people react and exactly. then we can sort of make our decision. Yeah. And I I seem to recall that in the Chiefs case with Hunt, it was very much the pressure came down and they're like we cannot have this. We're done here because of that. So my guess is, is that the Vikings are not going to make a quick move to cut Gladney, that they're going to say, okay, we're going to allow this to be investigated. You know, they'll they'll say all the right um, things as far as the investigations taking place in Texas. The league will look at, at this. We are appalled if this is true. The cutting move, I don't think, comes unless the public turns and says, no, he has to go, which they might. Which they might, but that that to me, that's the step between you're on a list where you can't play, but you're still on property because you were a first round pick. Yeah. To okay, from from a PR standpoint, from an advertising standpoint, we can't have this because the Peterson thing came down to me to one thing: the advertiser said we're out, and they're like, "Oh my god, we can't have that." Mm-hmm. And, well, and I- so that's what this is going to come down to: is is he cut? Or is he just uh, pretty much put on the shelf football-wise for now? But here's what's sad, because you you already brought it up off the top of this conversation. So I agree, they're probably going to see what public perception is and see, okay, what let's let's get some more details. And you know, I don't, I I do think there's a period here where you should let more information come in and you should let there be an investigation. Like I I agree with just pumping the brakes for a second. But you know what the biggest difference is? Let's say we see photos of the woman. Which oh, you're, no, may not exist. Maybe maybe they won't exist publicly. I don't know. But like, right? Like, do we need? Like, is that what you need? Like, do you need? Do you need to see that before you make a decision? Is it? Is it? It's worse now that there's photos, or is it not? Is it? Is it not bad enough that this happened and someone is and maybe Phil, multiple it, people are accounting that this happened? Like, I don't want him on the team anymore if this happened personally. Okay, get him off. I the ag- team. I agree, but you know as well as I do, if if photos. Or or more surface from this, he's gone for sure. Like I don't, I get your point, and I agree with your point. But I am telling you, like the steps to how this works now to me have become abundantly clear, right? Which is accusation, very troublesome, and, and I'm trying to, I'm sort of trying to see it, but I can't. But if we go to the next step of of her bruised, or or an actual. You know, documentation like with, with Rice uh, came out. If we see that, I think he's gone. That doesn't make that, do, that doesn't make it right. It's just how it plays out. Yeah, and it is too bad that like you know, I mean, how how often how often is there enough evidence to or, or, or there is there video evidence of the incident like Ray Rice? I mean, a lot of people just a lot of women have to deal with this in private right. and in isolation, right? So it just makes me mm-hmm. sick. You know, I, it makes me sick on one hand. I'm also all for people getting better as humans and getting second chances. But, like, man, it's hard to think that way when you see a report like this. So um, there's a lot we need to get to on sort of the football side of this for the Vikings, like, the you know, the non the, – the less important stuff. Unless you guys have any other thoughts on the arrest and the incident that's been reported by CBS Dallas and some of the local outlets here, we can sort of awkwardly transition into the football side if you guys are down for it. Yeah, that's yeah, what I was thinking. All right, all right, all right. So we're, we're going to awkwardly transition now to the there's no, well, there's no football. Good football. Yeah, football yeah. Let's get into quarterback play now. There we go. Okay. Right. Right. So now that we have awkwardly transitioned, um, Purple Daily is presented in part by our friends at Federated Mutual Insurance Company. 
And I'll tell you, Federated's been working with business owners in the state of Minnesota for a long time, for over 100 years. They're based in Owatonna. They are one of us. And uh, they measure their success by the success of their clients. And so they're here to help you with risk management. They're here to help you with peace of mind. And they've got tools and resources to help your business reach its peak level. Find out more about the industries that Federated protects and the work that they can do for you at federatedinsurance.com. Also, listen, it is is emerging fast on sustainable golf season. We've had teases of golf season, but sustainable golf season. Sustainable golf season. You never know because it was like three years ago on April 18th, (laughs) we got like 10 inches of snow and a blizzard and it just put everything to a halt. So it can happen. But PXG Minneapolis is here. It's a golfer's paradise. The new Gen 4 golf clubs have landed. Drivers, fairways, hybrids, irons. These are PXG's flagship clubs. These are ridiculously great performing clubs. Uh, And a lot of people are saying these are the best clubs PXG, which makes great clubs, has ever made. So check it out. They also have the spring and summer apparel selection in the store, PXG Minneapolis in Southdale Center. And you can find out more and peruse through their collections at pxg.com slash Minneapolis. Football. So first, first football question off of this. Are the Vikings now in the market to draft a cornerback? Okay. There's an unknown factor to the question that you just asked that's extremely important. And I think right now that the only people with the answer reside in in Egan and are the Vikings, and that's this. Is Mike Hughes, can he be counted on after being lost in back-to-back years with neck problems? I've heard... I've heard conflicting things. Like, I've heard them say, oh, yeah, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. I don't know why I buy that. I've also heard that there's at least trepidation. So, if Mike Hughes, if if you're confident, which is a, which is a step, I, I mean, that might be a leap, but you've got, um, you've got Patrick Peterson now, Dantzler starts outside, Alexander is back to play inside. If Mike Hughes can uh, play, that's a nice buffer right there. Yes. But but that being said, can you trust a guy who's had his year come to an end in back-to-back seasons because of a neck problem? So the answer to your question might be an unequivocal, I'm not sure, and I wouldn't definitely say the answer is yes. They are much more in, a, in the market for a cornerback today than they were when this show came to a conclusion on Monday. Yeah, here's I, I don't think it puts them in the market at pick 14 right now unless they lo- – let's say they love Patrick Sertan and he's sitting there or something and like Mike Zimmer is saying, listen, a week ago I wouldn't have been clamoring for this. But now – but the fact is if they're trying to win in 2021 and they're trying to potentially find a starting player with that 14th overall pick, which is your only pick in the first 70 picks or whatever – you already have three starters at cornerback right now, and maybe if Mike Hughes is healthy, you've got a four a guy who has started who becomes sort of your your insurance policy, right? What I want to know is when they brought in Mackenzie Alexander and Patrick Peterson, who did they think they also had? like? Did they think going in because that was two three weeks ago? This Gladney incident happened on Friday, so they didn't know that Gladney was going to be unavailable potentially until Friday, I would think. Sure. Or so later, did, yeah. Did they make the moves? You know, did they did they sign Peterson and Alexander thinking that they were going to have Gladney and Hughes and they just wanted a ton of depth? Or did they think they weren't going to have Hughes because of injuries? Like, I, I don't know what they know about their depth I when think they made these signings two weeks ago. I think there's genuine concern about Hughes, and, and I think there's also worry at the least about Dantzler's ability to stay healthy. He, he missed time last year, and he's a really slight dude. And I'm sure they're trying to put some weight on him. But that being said, like if you, you know, some guys just get hurt, right? And and Zim made comments a couple times last year about the fact that Dantzler has to find a way to stay out there. And he struggled to. So I think they brought in depth, one, because just to help out with, at the time, Gladney and Dantzler, but also because of concerns about Dantzler and Hughes. And so that's where I think that I think your question is a legit one. Um, this to me now, Phil, it also emboldens Zim's let's get more defensive platform, right? Because he still says defensive end to, to bookend with Hunter. We need that. And now I could use another corner. This all goes to the to Zim's philosophy of our offense is pretty good, right? 
but our defense needs more. Well, today it needs more than it did yesterday. So I just think that this gives his his sort of soapbox routine of let's get more defense, more voice. I don't know. I like that, but it's the reality of where things stand if Gladney can't play, and my guess is he can't. Well, you're seeing how hard it is, as much of an effort as the Vikings have made this offseason, you're seeing how hard it is to build a team fundamentally, like in terms of your core main mission for winning as a team, you're seeing how hard it is for it to be defense. And I think you're seeing like, oh, like they did it in 2017 and they built the number one defense and so they can just do it again because they have Mike Zimmer and they can use their free agency money, et cetera. But I was uh, I was scrolling through mindlessly on the Internet on Instagram or TikTok last night. I can't remember. I think it was on Instagram at Phil Mackey on Instagram, if you want to at uh, the Dexter over there and at Jay Zolgad. And it was a it was um, like a meme Not on TikTok. It was like a meme video of yep. someone trying to herd 12 cats, little kittens, into a photo. They wanted to line up 12 kittens and take a photo of the 12 kittens lined up. And it was, it was. I think the meme was like, this is what it's like to be a manager of a department, right? And it's like, he lines up six of them, and then he goes and gets four more, and then three of the original six wander off. And then like he's spending a minute trying to line up these <laughs> these 12 kittens, and that's... That's the best metaphor I can think of for trying to build a team around defense. Mm -hmm. It sounds great. Yeah, you just, boy, we're just like three pieces away if you get this and this, and then all of a sudden your cornerback gets arrested. And then all of a sudden your number one draft pick cornerback from the year before has a second, he has a knee and a neck. Oh, and then Daniel Hunter has a neck because football's violent and you get hurt. And 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 then and then all of a sudden, well, okay, well, those guys come back healthy and then, oh, shoot, Anthony Barr is getting a little older and wasn't as good as he was a couple years ago. Or, oh, Everson Griffin got really old and he's gone. <laughs> and Linval Joseph got old and he's gone. And it's like, it's like, it's the cat metaphor of like, oh, you just need to get them all lined up at the same time and then then, then we can win with defense, right? There's It's right. so hard and you have to get lucky and be great and draft really well, right? Whereas if you right. go down the route of offense first, and I know that it's not easy to find a franchise quarterback, but if you can find a franchise quarterback – and you're going to build your team around offense first and foremost. Once you find the franchise quarterback, it makes up for if you don't have a left guard one year. I mean, the Seattle Seahawks are a great example. Yeah, they've got some problems with Russell Wilson right now, and it's way easier said than done to just be like, find a Russell Wilson. I totally get that. But once you find a Russell Wilson, even though he's pissed right now, you can still win like 11 or 12 games and make noise in the playoffs without like two offensive linemen and with a rotating group of running backs and – because he because he makes up like fifty percent of your offense's success, right? On defense, it's much more eleven equal pieces, maybe skewing slightly to the pass rushers. And so the Vikings are finding out these last two years how hard it is to herd those defensive cats and get them all perfectly lined up in their prime, et cetera. Uh, PFF Brad put a little chart together. I would I would share it in the screen, but it wouldn't just be wouldn't be really conducive to see the entire audience. But he basically he put. Draft capital at every position since 2016, the percentage of, of, of what that team spent at that position. And since 2016, the Vikings have spent 18% of their draft capital at cornerback, which is the most wow. that they've spent on any yeah. position. The next closest one would be wide receiver at 16%. And, like, for example, they've 0.8% point, at, quarter, at quarterbacks, 5.2% at guards, eight at tackles so like they have taken a ton of stab at cornerbacks the vikings have only the carolina panthers have spent more draft resources and capital at the cornerback position than the vikings since 2016 and judge you've got the data on the first round we should go over that too here i mean oh, the vikings first round picks so since mike got here so that this is a this is a rick spielman zimmer production okay <laughs> 2014 that draft first round not bad uh, they, they traded, I think, from 8 to 9 and took Barr. Fine. Teddy was the 32nd pick that they took when they made a trade. I think it was with Seattle at the time. Now, they got unfortunate with or unlucky with the quarterback, but that's not a bad draft. Like, the thought process there, I think, is pretty pretty good. Uh, 2015, first-round pick, 11th pick overall, Trey Waynes. People rip on Trey Waynes, but I really thought that he was solid. Like, he's not he was not a Pro Bowl player. But you know what he was? He was a guy who could tackle. And we saw, we've seen bad corners, and Trey Waynes was not bad. And but he, now, wasn't a, he wasn't a star. 
He was not a star. He was not a star. But what I'm I'm cautioning you because it's about to go off the charts. 2016, 23rd pick, goes to the, the position that I think Dex said was the second most capital-wise for the Vikings, Laquan Treadwell. That's 23rd pick, Laquan Treadwell, okay? So that's a massive miss because he was awful. 2017 was the Bradford trade, so they actually didn't have a first-round pick. And they arguably had the best, their best top pick with Zim and Spielman, Dalvin Cook at 41. Yep. Uh, 2018, the 30th pick, Mike Hughes, cornerback. Yep. That's unfortunate there because I don't know if he is going to, if he's going to have uh, much more of a career. And if he does, it's certainly been altered by the fact that he tore his ACL as a rookie yep. and has had neck problems. Yep. 2000. It's, 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 real quick on Hughes, yeah. like. Go ahead. It's not all injury based with him, but it's when you tear your knee so early in your career too. It does it does alter you physically, so it's hard to tell. Yeah, and I think he was. I think he. I think he was a good, smart player, but yeah, it, it definitely slowed him down. So 2019, another. This is a definite pick for need. So this is not the best player. This is just a need pick. 18th, Garrett Bradbury. As of right now, he has. Very much underperformed. He he's 100%. he was better in year two, and he's a, he's an okay run blocker, but he's one of the worst pass blocking centers in the entire league. I I think it's Straight fair up. to say, I think it's fair to say with Bradbury, Phil, if he has a similar PFF pass blocking year in 2021, he's a bust. Yeah, because I mean that's awful. He's trending more towards bust category than he is. Yeah, and a it's going to be year three, right? Yeah, like like if you still can't pass protect in year three. You're basically a bust, I think. Yep. yep. Uh, and then 2020, uh, obviously Jefferson with the 22nd pick was a great pick, and then Gladney they traded down and took him at 31. Yeah. So just so Je- Jefferson, huge star. Delvin yep. Cook was a second round pick. A lot. Otherwise, it's a lot. It's it's either busts or some injury cases or guys that were fine like Trey Wayne's. Um, but not a lot of they haven't hit on star players. Do you know what's surprising? Players much in the first round. Yeah. Do you know what's what's surprising about that statement? There is not one defensive star there. Like this, this is a team. This is a team built on a philosophy of what defense, right? That Yabar, list does not well, have. Harrison Smith was drafted in the first round before Zimmer got, but that's here, before right? Zimmer. Mm-hmm. But like I, but I, I'm saying the guys that Mike Xavier obviously Rhodes. watches tape of and salivates about. There's not one star there. So you're saying what your point is? The guy, since, since Zimmer's been here, yes, people are going to say, "What do you? Well, Spielman's making the draft pick, Zolgad. What are you talking about? Well, Zimmer, no. Zimmer is is the one who's saying Anthony Barr. Anthony, yes, Barr, he told like, Rick to, to yes, yep. So Anthony Barr, Trey Waynes, Mike Hughes, and Jeff Gladney. And then by the way. On the Gladney and Hughes front, whether some of it's injury, I mean, he was so down on those guys. He literally said he was like down in the dumps at home looking at the roster in that press conference last week and felt so bad about it that they couldn't wait to sign Mackenzie Alexander back and Patrick Peterson back. So, so yeah, so I guess the question there is what do you do if Mike Zimmer comes knocking on the war room door as pick 14 <laughs> pops up on the clock and Bang. says, guys, Bang, Quitty Pay it. is my guy. I've been watching film on him all off season. I close it. I close yeah. it. I'm go. I'm going. I am going to jump in the camp of the cliche. This is one, and I I know that it's 2021 or bust, right? That like, that there are people with their jobs on the line, no question about it. But I'm going to jump in the boat of you this year. Take the best player available at that point. You take the best talent. Because I mean, the Bradbury one scares me a lot because I don't care what the Vikings say. The Bradbury one was an, oh, my God, we got to find an interior O lineman. We got to find a center. Let's just take this guy. And he's not even the best center from that draft now. Yep. I mean, that that's a that's a cautionary tale for trying to fill a need desperately. Yep. yep. So, yeah, so the Jeff, I mean, the Jeff Gladney situation, very unfortunate. Uh, just an absolutely heinous report that came out. We'll see what other information comes out, but it puts the Vikings from a football perspective in an interesting spot, and it might open up just some some cornerback need that they didn't think that they had about a week ago. And we'll see what happens. But yeah, that's an interesting 
look back at the Mike Zimmer influenced defensive picks in the first round. Now, in fairness, like they've hit on some non first round guys like Daniel oh, Hunter in that era who've been ridiculous. Yes, absolutely. And it wasn't Eric Correct. Kendricks a second round pick, if I'm yes. not yeah. mistaken. Yep. And yep. So no, they've hit absurd. on some. The yep. first round just not impressive defensively. And then Cam Dantzler, if he pans out the way that we think he might, then you know he was a mid round pick. But yep. so all right, so kind of kind of a buzz Killington episode there of Purple Daily. But listen, I mean, it's we're just reacting to what's happening with the Vikings. So thanks for hanging out with us here. You can find us daily Vikings entertainment with Mackie and Judd and Declan. Two different shows, by the way. Purple Daily, which you can find Apple, Spotify, YouTube, scorenorth.com in the app, and then Mackie and Judd also on those same platforms and a different YouTube channel. So thanks to everyone who has supported us, who supports our sponsors, and also who has clicked subscribe on Score North or Purple Daily YouTube. And we'll see you guys tomorrow for Write That Down Predictions.